Okay, uh, so thanks Alberto for accepting our invitation to give a talk here. Um, so you have the floor, go for it. Thank you, thank you the organizer for uh, inviting me. It's a really, I'm very uh, glad to be here, to be given a chance to talk. And um, so yeah, today I would like to talk about what I've been working on at WashU for my, uh, during my PhD years. And what we did together with my uh, advisor, John McCarthy, was to um, extend interpolating uh, theorems on interpolating sequences in one or several variables to sequences of matrices, of square matrices, or of D2 polar commuti and n non commuting matrices. In particular, like in, 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 in the first half, we will extend Carlson interpolation theorem to such an object. And in the second half, we will study separately the non commuting setting and the commuting setting in which to extend some uh, partial results on interpolated sequences on the polydisc, for example, to D2 pulse of square matrices. So let me start with the, with the background, what was known before we start. So uh, a sequence, lambda, in the unit disk is said to be interpolating. If given any sequence of bounded target, Wn, C, which is one uh, bounded in a linearity function in H infinity that sends each lambda n to each uh, Wn. And of course, uh, intuitively, being interpolating for a sequence is a matter of how that sequence is separated because you want to specify the value of a function arbitrarily at each point. And so it makes sense that we want to separate them with holomorphic functions since we want to uh, interpolate those points with holomorphic functions. And with this in mind, we define a sequence um, to be strongly separated if there exists a bounded uh, sequence in H infinity such that each uh, um, function of the sequence separates one point of the sequence from all the others. Namely, phi n of uh, lambda n is one and phi n of lambda j is zero whenever j is not equal to, uh, to n. And the important thing is that this sequence is bounded. Their h infinity norm is uniformly bounded above. And in the same like uh, fashion, uh, the sequence is weakly separated if there exists a bounded sequence, phi n j, such that uh, for any pair of distinct indices, uh, n and, 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 and j, P and J separates in the same way lambda n and lambda j, namely phi n of lambda n is one and phi n of lambda j is zero. Okay, the study of uh, interpolating sequences it turns out to be very uh, connected and to uh, the theory of uh, Hilbert spaces, to some kind of Hilbert spaces at least. And by that, I'm not saying that H infinity is not is a Hil Hil Hilbert space because it's not but it's strictly related to one of them, namely the Hardy space, which for me today is the reproducing kernel Hilbert space uh, of um, an analytic function on the unit disk with square summable Taylor coefficients. Now by reproducing kernel Hilbert space, I mean that of course point evaluation at each point of the disk is bounded in H2, which means uh, that for any point, thanks to recent representation theorem for each point W in the unit disk, there exists one kernel function, the Zigo kernel in this case, which is this uh, geometric uh, power series that represents the value of any uh, functions in H2 via the hinder product in H2. And uh, the way that uh, H infinity relates with such a Hilbert space is that H infinity coincides isometrically with the multiplier algebra of H2, namely the set of holomorphic function on the unit disk that multiplies H2 into itself. And by isometrically, I mean that actually the H infinity norm, so this is the supremum norm of a function in H infinity coincide with the operator norm of uh, multiplication by phi in H2. And so the reason why this is important for interpolating sequences is that it's not very hard to show that any um, uh, Zigo kernel at any point of the disk is an eigenfunction of any adjoint of multiplication by a function in H infinity. And the eigenvalue, as you can see, is ex exactly phi of w bar. And so really specifying the value that a holomorphic function has uh, to some point of a sequence will be the same as specifying the eigenvectors and the eigenvalues of a bounded uh, operator, mp star. And so that's why one uses uh, Hilbert spaces to study interpolating sequences, at least for this reproducing kernel Hilbert space setting. Okay, um, one other way to, uh, it, it, it turns out that one can use a, a Hilbert spaces to separate those points. 
Because if you think about it, a sequence will be separated if it goes fast enough to the boundary of the unit circle. And uh, saying that it's going fast enough, one way to say it, to see that is by uh, defining a measure which is supported of that sequence and see if that measure uh, has some kind of boundedness condition. And that's the idea of Kylosome measure. Like if you have a reproducing kernel of Hilbert space of a domain X of the of CD, then a measure on X is a Kylosome measure for that reproducing kernel of Hilbert space. If uh, L2 of X with respect to that measure and that continuously in the reproducing kernel uh, HK. And so with this in mind, one can say that famous characterization of Carlson around the 60s, where he proved that a sequence lambda in the unit disk is interpolating, if and only if it is strongly separated, or if and only if it is just weakly separated, and this measure, which is a weighted sum of Dirac delta at the points of the sequences, is a Carlson measure for the Harvey space. And you see here for the way this measure is defined, um, uh, the weights that each point has is comparable to its distance from the from the, the boundary. For, so really, this uh, measure being a Carlson measure is telling us something about how the sequence uh, is going fast uh, to the boundary. So how separated it is. Okay. So um, the goal, the first goal of this talk, is to extend this theorem, Carlson theorem, to sequences of square matrices of any size. And so we will see how to define uh, interpolating sequence of matrices, to separate matrices as we did before. And then we will have to find a re re replacement for this Carlson measure condition because it's not very clear how to define a measure supported on a sequence of matrices. And so to do that, we're going to use an equivalent condition to this Carlson measure condition, which is given in terms of Bessel system. Now, if, if you have uh, any Hilbert space Bessel, and you have a sequence of unit vectors, that's going to be a risk system if they are, in a certain sense, almost orthogonal. So if the norm in uh, age of any linear combination of those vectors is comparable to the L2 norm of the coefficient. And if only this right inequality holds, we say that, not only, but if the right inequality holds, we say that this sequence is a Bessel system. And so one fact that is going to be important for us to extend that kind of measure condition in the future in the later, later in the talk, is that in H2, of, in any reproducing kernel of Hilbert space, really, really, but in particular in H2, that measure that we were considering before is a Carlson measure, if and only if the normalized kernel at the points of the sequence is a Bessel system. And so what we're, we're going to do with our mat mat matrices, rather, rather than defining the trying to define a measure support on those matrices, will be trying to find a replacement for a kernel to a for a matrix and prove some Bessel system condition on that sequence. And so that's the condition. Con condition two is the one that we're going to extend uh, for matrices. So we're going to look more at 2D Hilbert space approach to interpolating sequences. OK, so as, as, as I was saying, uh, the question that started my PhD was the following. Can we extend Carlson interpolation theorem to sequences of square mat matrices? And here, by sequences of square matrices, I mean any sequence of square matrices. Uh, and the sizes of those matrices are whatever. So the first one can be 2 by 2. The second one can be 7 by 7. The third one can be a scalar, 1 by 1, and so on. There is no like condition on the bound, on the di dimension of the matrix. And of course, when you um, the way we apply a holomorphic function to a matrix is by extending Cauchy integral formula, so by using the function of calculus. And since we're going to use a holomorphic function in the unit disk, we're going to ask for this inverse here to make sense. We're going to ask that all the spectra of our matrices belong to the unit disk. And so, as far as uh, we knew, there were no like no one even really. Uh, asked that question before. So we actually had to come up with a definition of interpolating sequence of matrices itself. And one uh, attempt, the first attempt was the following. So you can say that a sequence of matrices, AN, is interpolating if for any bounded sequence of targets uh, of the right sizes, of course, so the size of WN would match the size of AN. And by bounded, I mean in the operator norm. Then there exists a function in each infinity, a bounded analysis function that sends each AN to each WN. And this, though, doesn't really work very well. And the reason why that's true is that basically uh, 
holomorphic function preserve invariant subspaces of a matrix. And so in particular, preserve the Jordan canonical form. So if you, for example, have a whole uh, have an intercalating sequence, lambda n, you construct a two by two diagonal matrix like lambda n times that entity, and you want, of course, that sequence to be interpolating as well for the definition to be a uh, consistent to be a good one. But then you realize that if you take a Jordan block, a non-trivial Jordan block like that, that's bounded in your operator norm, you can find a function that sends the spectrum of the n to w1, namely the constant function equal to w1. But there is no holomorphic function that sends a n, sorry, a1 to this matrix here, because a holomorphic function would send a diagonal matrix to a diagonal matrix. And so according to this definition, even a one-point interpolation problem fails. You can be solved. And so the way we overcame this uh, obstruction was just to identify a sequence of targets, a bounded targets with a bounded sequence in each instance. And so we say that a, uh, the sequence A of square matrices is interpolating if for any sequence of bounded function in each instance, there exists one function in each instance that agrees with each one of the Vn at each node. So V of An is equal to Vn of An which of course uh, extends the definition for scalars. But also one uh, legitimate uh, candidate for definition is by uh, considering diagonal targets. And where by diagonal targets, I mean that I, for any bounded sequence in, H in C, Wn, there exists one function phi that sends phi, that sends, sorry, An to Wn times that entity. And uh, of course, the, this first definition, they, they both extend the definition for scalars. The first definition that I gave you implies the second one, because you just have to choose the phi n, the sequence of function to be constant function, and you get the second definition. But the first non-trivial result that I would like to share with you is that the second one implies the first one as well. So considering this bounded targets has bounded sequence in each infinity, or just considering uh, as infinity targets in C, it's going to be the, the same thing, even for this um, matrix node uh, problem. Okay, so now that we came up with the definition of interpolating sequences, we want to, say, to find a way to separate them, as we did for the scalar case. And that's going to follow more or less the same outline, because we say that the sequence of matrices is strongly separated if, uh, for any n, you can separate the nth matrix a n with the rest of the matrices of the sequence, namely with a function phi n of uniform uh, uh, bounded uh, norm. And here by se 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 separating, I mean that phi n of a n is that entity matrix and phi n of a j is just the zero matrix of, of course, the corresponding size. And uh, you might have guessed what going to happen for weak separation, it's going to be like there exists a bounded sequence phi and j such that each phi and j separates a n with n j. So phi n of a n is the entity, phi n of a j is the zero matrix. Okay, so now we, as I was suggesting before, what we have to do is to find a good replacement for those kernel functions, because we saw before that in H2 for a uh, the classic interpolating problem, you end up studying the sequence of zero kernels at a matrix. Here, for matrices, um, you do something similar, but you replace the uh, zero kernels with those uh, subspaces, with multi-dimensional subspaces of H2. And so we define for any n, and for the matrix A n in the sequence, uh, Hn to be the orthogonal complement in H2 of all those functions that vanishes at the matrix A n. And so thanks to the uh, re reproducing property, one can observe that if A was just a scalar, so it was one by one, then HN is nothing but the line spanned by the kernel at the function lambda N. So this, in a certain sense, extends. This will work as reproducing kernel at matrices, those subspaces. And in particular, one thing that we proved is that separation with respect to H infinity function, so the separation for matrices that we just defined in the previous slide, coincide with uh, some separation condition on those subspaces. In particular, uh, A will be strongly separated if and only if the sign of the angle between the, the, nth H, so the nth subspace, Hn, 
and the closure of all the other subfaces is uniformly bounded below. And similarly, it will be weakly separated if given any two distinct uh, HNs, so those uh, subspaces, the sign of the angle between them is uniformly bounded below. So the sign of, of the angle work, works as a sort of a distance for the matrices. And those two notions are equivalent. Okay, so let me um, give you a kind of more, I guess, uh, concrete idea of what the H, those H ends here are. And so sort of a justification why I keep calling them kernel band matrices. And what we to do that is by ob ob observing very trivially that if two matrices M and N are uh, similar, then if you, have a, if you apply to them a holomorphic function, half of N is also similar to half of M. And the matrix that does the similarity is the same, the same P. And so with a loss of generality, we can assume that the sequence AN that we're starting with is it in its Jordan canonical form. So we have all their eigenvalue uh, shown with all the sizes of those Jordan blocks, which is important because when you apply now a holomorphic function to a Jordan block, what happens is that one can show that you just get f at the eigenvalue of, in the main diagonal, that you, you get f prime at the eigenvalue on the second diagonal, and so on, until you pick up a certain number of the derivatives, depending on how large your uh, your Jordan block is. And so one realizes that if you wanted to interpolate those matrices, what you really want to do is like you want to specify the value of a function at its eigenvalue, plus you want to be able to specify some certain number of derivatives at the eigenvalue. So it's kind of a gen gen generalized interpolating property. And in particular, that means that each HN, those kernels in a certain sense, are finite dimensional because they're just, they are just going to be spanned by the kernel, the kernels at the eigenvalues of, of a n, plus a certain numbers of kernels that represent not the value of a function in H two, but the value of the derivative of a function, which it turns out to be the partial derivative with respect to w bar of a kernel. So, um, morally, if you want to know what the value of a function at the matrix is, you need to know what the value of the function are at its eigenvalues, and you need to be able to specify a certain number of the derivatives. And therefore, thanks to the reproducing property, those HN are just spanned by those kernels at the eigenvalue, plus some kernels that represent a certain number of derivatives at a, um, at a point of uh, the unit disk. Okay, now with this in mind, we can again ask, our separation condition on those HN gonna be equivalent to interpolating conditions for the sequence of matrices. And that's gonna be the, the case. But before uh, stating that, let me just uh, remind you that by, uh, separation, by se separating those uh, HNs, I mean that they are kind of almost orthogonal as before. And in particular, one can extend the, the notion of risk system and Bessel system to multi-dimensional uh, subspaces of a silver space. You just need to ask that no matter how you pick a sequence of unit vectors in which each vector is chosen from a different subspace, then that sequence is a, is a risk system or respectively a Bessel system. And it's important that the constant C that you choose, that, that, that you see here, uh, do not depend on the sequence that you pick. You just have your sequence of subspaces. So there exists a C such that no matter how you pick a sequence of unit vectors in each subspace, then you have this condition. And so now we can finally state the, our first main result, which is basically Carlson interpolation theorem for matrices, because we, we proved that A is interpolating, if and only if it is strongly separated, if and only if the sequence HN is a risk system, and if and only if it is weakly separated, and uh, the sequence HN is a Bessel system. So you see that condition one, two, and four are exactly the, the three conditions uh, in Carlson corona, in, in Carlson interpolation theorem for if those uh, matrices would happen to be scale scalars. And the reason why four corresponds to the Carlson uh, uh, measure condition is because as we saw 
a cardiosol measure condition corresponds to a Bessel condition on the kernels. And so here we just replace the, the kernels with ATHN. And we ask that those are a Bessel group. The one that was missing in Carlson theorem was the condition number three. The HN is a risk system. And that was proven already for scalars in the 70s, I think. It was known already, but not for matrices, of course. So that's why we, uh, that was our, the, the first part of my uh, dissertation in a certain sense. Okay, so let me just give you an, an example of, uh, to maybe have some idea more fixed which is the following. So um, suppose that you pick for any n, two to the n, uh, if we distribute the points on the unit circle. And then you create a diagonal matrix, uh, Wn, which is diagonal and has those points as its eigenvalues. Now, each one of those matrices has its spectra on the unit circle. So if you want those matrices to be, uh, if you want to apply holomorphic function to them in the unit disk, we need to rescale them with a sequence Rn such that An, which is equal to Rn times Wn, has its spectrum in the unit circle. And so we might ask, um, how fast does the sequence Rn have to go to the boundary, to, to one, sorry, such that the sequence An that you construct in this fashion is interpolating. Here, this picture is mostly so that you can see what I'm talking about. Like the, each color will correspond to a different matrix and uh, the points that you see on each color circle are the eigenvalues of each different matrix. So I, I fix those points and I'm, and I'm kind of uh, allowed to choose the sequence Rn as, as I want. And I want to find the cutoff condition so that the sequence of matrices that I get this way is interpolating. And the answer turns out to be that the sequence An such defined <clears throat> is interpolating if and only if it is a zero sequence. Now, by a zero sequence, I mean that the sequence of all their eigenvalue uh, is a zero sequence, is a Blaschke sequence. And by that, I mean that this sum uh, converges. So if those points are well separated, then the matrices will be well separated as well. And, uh, and therefore, the sequence will be interpolating in the matrix setting as well. Um, <clears throat> Another thing that I would like to talk about briefly is the connection between the fact finger conjecture and interpolating sequences um, and how this and if and how this extends to this matrix problem. So the fact finger conjecture, which is not conjecture anymore, it was proven by uh, Mark Schulman and Srivastava uh, some years ago, state that uh, any vessel system of unit vectors in any Harvey space is the, um, can be partitioned into finally many risk systems. Okay, so what does that mean when this sequence is a sequence of normalized kernel function, normalized Zigo kernel function in H2? Well, if you start then with a sequence in H2, which is weakly separated, and uh, the Carlson measure condition holds, that means that the um, sequence of normalized Zico kernel is a Bessel system. And therefore, by uh, Markus Spielmann and, and Srivastava theorem, it can be partitioned into finally many uh, risk system, which means that the sequence lambda can be partitioned into finally many interpolating sequence. So kind of a, a posteriori, a, a fortiori, you can get by Carlson interpolation theorem. But actually, thanks to the uh, positive solution of the factorial conjecture, Carlson, uh, Carlson interpolation theorem is the same as, as saying that if you have a sequence, a, a weakly separated sequence that can be written as uh, the finite union of finite disjoint union of interpolating sequences, that the whole sequence will be interpolating for each infinity. And so um, when I read that, I was kind of asking myself, okay, is that true for uh, sequences of matrices as well? Is the kind of analogous of this uh, Marcus Spielman and Srivastava true, uh, theorem true for uh, sequences of subspaces now of uh, H2. And the answer is that, well, one part extends and the other one doesn't. Namely, we still prove without using the uh, factorial conjecture 
that if you have a sequence of matrices, which is weakly separated, and it can be written into finally many interpolating sequences, then the uh, whole sequence will be interpolating and vice versa. Um, and so we ask, okay, if we notice that if then any uh, vessel system of those kernels can be partitioned into finally many root systems, also when the uh, HNs are multidimensional, those two facts together will give me a proof of the theorem that we that I stated be, be, before, at least for part the last condition. But this kind of multidimensional factoring or conjecture turn out to be false. And an easy way to see that is by taking the example of B4, in which each color circle is, is, is a matrix. And then to that sequence, you add a sequence of points of scalars, so a one by one matrices, if you want. And you uh, basically what you do is that your sequence, lambda n, is approaching, is getting closer and closer to the eigenvalues of the matrices. And so if you take the union, so if, if you take the sequence of matrices plus this sequence of scalars, and you consider this whole union sequence as a sequence of matrices itself, then, uh, well, there is no way you can write that as the finite union of weakly separated sequence even, because you see that those lambdas are approaching um, your uh, each matrix. And there is two to the n for any circle. And since n is going to infinity, you will not be able to write that as a finite union as weakly separated sequence. But on the other hand, if you let Rn, the parameter Rn going, oops, sorry, going to uh, one very fast, you can still achieve the fact that the whole sequence will be a vessel system. So by doing this, we constructed a sequence of matrices or matrices and scalars all together, such that um, the corresponding kernels, HN, are a vessel system, but they cannot be partitioned into finally many weeks, weekly separated sequences, and therefore they cannot be a real system either. Okay, so that concludes what I want to talk about for the one variable case. And uh, the second half of my talk will like, kind of go through uh, what happens when you want to extend um, something like this to the multivariable setting. And as we will see, of course, uh, the main difference when you're talking about matrices, when, you want to, uh, when your variables are matrices now is that they can commute and they cannot commute. And depending on in which case you are, you're gonna use a very different class of function. So let, let, let me start with the commuting case here. And for the commuting case, we're gonna try to extend some results on interpolating sequences that are known for the, uh, for the polygroup. So DD here is uh, the, the Cartesian product of D copies of the unit disk. And um, a sequence lambda in the unit disk, sorry, in the poly disk, is interpolating. <clears throat> if for any, again, for any bounded target W, N, and C, there exists a function phi in each infinity of the poly disk now. So the bounded analytic function on the poly disk that send um, each lambda n to each W. N. And as for the case d equal to one, one can define a distance that works very well with those uh, holomorphic function, which is called the Gleason distance for us here. And in which, you know, you, you, you measure the distance between two points Z and W in the, in the poly disk by looking at um, the absolute value of phi of Z whenever uh, phi uh, ranges in the unit ball of each infinity and phi vanishes at W. And you think that the biggest that this quantity can get. So this how large can a Holomorphic, uh, holomorphic function in the unit ball of each infinity can get if you know that it vanishes at uh, W, you can get at C. And so now that you have a distance, you can define what weak separation and strong separation are. And here I'm talking about scal scalars now. I didn't say that, but those are all points in the poly disk. I'm not talking about matrices yet. And so it will be weakly separated, of course, if even any two distant point of the sequence their Gleason distance is uh, uniformly bounded below, and it will be strongly separated if, uh, if you fix one point of the sequence, lambda n, and then you take the product of all the Gleason distance between that point and all the other points of the sequence that's going to be uniformly bounded below. By the way, all those points, the rho gz 
w, they're all between zero and, and, and one. So asking that this product converges is a pretty strong um, um, condition. And of course, in particular, if d is equal to one, the Gibson distance is just the pseudo hyperbolic distance. And therefore, we re recover weak separation and strong separation as we defined before. So that's consistent from that point. Now, it turns out that uh, you can use uh, Hilbert spaces to study interpolating sequences in the Paul disk as well. But there is a very uh, strong and dramatic difference, in my opinion. That is, that for the one variable case, the, uh, the Zigo kernel, so H2, the hard space, uh, encodes all the possible information that you will want for uh, separation and for interpolation of a sequence. Whereas in the when d is bigger than one, so in, 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 in the poly disk, you need to use a lot of kernels at the same time because the Zigo kernel, because there is of course a, a Zigo kernel for the poly disk as well, there's a hard space for the poly disk as well, but it's not enough taken by itself to uh, give you information about whether the sequence is, is, is interpolating or not. And so um, what we do is that we use the all the wall class of ad admissible kernels. So first of all, if you have a, a reproducing kernel Hilbert space HK on the poly disk, so you have its uh, associated kernel KW for any W in the poly disk, which again represents the, uh, the value of any function in HK through the inner product. Now this, this kernel will be admissible. We say that it's admissible if um, <clears throat> the uh, multiplication by the coordinate function zeta i are commuting contractions in HK. Of course, that's not true for all the possible kernels that you can choose on the poly disk. But it seems to be a reasonable thing to ask because we want the uh, multiplier algebra to be H infinity. An example of such kernels that one can think of, for example, in the bi disk, are those weighted sort of uh, zero uh, kernel in the poly disk, in which you just move, multiply a zero kernel in the first variable as you kernel in the second variable with some weights m1 and 2 and as long as those weights are bigger than one that kernel will be admissible just to have some example in mind and what's important for us is that <clears throat> if d is equal to 2 so if, if you're in the by disk you have a very powerful tool which is called andos in inequality which in particular implies that <clears throat> the uh, class of admissible kernel on the by disk uh, exactly coincides with the class of kernels such that the multiplier algebra of HK is, is H infinity. And since we want to interpolate using H infinity function, that's going to be very important for us. And that's also why, so we know this for the input to two. We don't know if that's true for, we know that Andos inequality is not true for D bigger than two, but we, we don't know if this identification between uh, admissible kernels and kernels with multiplier algebra equal to h infinity extends to d bigger than or equal to three. And so the fact that we know that only for d equal to two, it's kind of the reason why we have a characterization of interpolating sequences only for the by disk. And that's due to Adler and McCarthy, um, who proved that a sequence lambda is interpolating. So they gave a bunch of different conditions, but the one that I want to state here uh, is that a sort of a risk system condition has to hold for uh, normalized kernels as for the one variable case, but it has to hold for all the possible admissible kernel at the same time, not just for the zero one. And the bound, the risk bound C uh, has to be of course independent of the kernel of the admissible kernel that you choose. So being interpolating is the same thing as a risk system condition for the kernels, for the admissible kernels, not only for the zero kernel. And if you want a more practical, sufficient and necessary condition for interpolating sequences, you can go look at the, this result by Burst and Chang Lin in the 87, where uh, they proved that those uh, three extension of the conditions in Carlos and interpolation theorem still relates to interpolating sequences in the poly disk, but they're not a characterization any, any, any anymore. Indeed, they prove that uh, if D, oh, actually, <clears throat> yes, if D is bigger than one, then lambda is strongly separated, 
that will in, in, imply that lambda is interpolating, and that will imply that it is weakly separated and this weighted sum of Dirac delta <clears throat> is a, a Carlson measure for the Hardy space in the poly disk. But for d bigger than one, none on the converse holds. Whereas, of course, for d equal to one, the fact that those three are equivalent is exactly Carlson interpolation theorem. So this theorem is true for any d, not only d equal to two, but <clears throat> on the other hand, it's not a characterization. And so what we did is just look at those two results and can we extend them to uh, d-tuples of commuting matrices. And so first of all, uh, <clears throat> we're considering uh, d-tuples of commuting matrices because we want to apply a holomorphic function to them in the, in the, in the polys. And so to do so, we again extend uh, uh, Cauchy integral formula in the poly disk. And again, for those inverses in the uh, formula to make sense, we're going to need to ask that the joint spectra now of those commuting matrices um, belong to, to the poly disk. So that's, again, an assumption that I'm going to make from now on. <clears throat> and luckily, the definition that we gave for the one variable case is very uh, versatile. It was adapted to very kind of different uh, interpolating problems that we're going to study here. And so we say that, that a sequence of d-tuples of commuting matrices AN is interpolating if for an, again for any bounded sequence in H infinity, now it's a continuum of the polys, of course. There exists one function bounded in an analytics that uh, agrees with uh, each phi n at each uh, a n, at each matrix a n. <clears throat> and as for the one variable case, this uh, is equivalent to a, a priori weaker interpolation condition, which asks only to be able to interpolate diagonal targets. So that will be the same as asking that for any bounded sequence in C, you can send each a n to w n times that entity via a, a bounded and analytic function in the polys. Okay, so one can just try to do the same thing that we did for. Uh, <clears throat> For the one variable case, remember we took the zero kernel, so we kind of extended the notion of kernels to the to a matrix. Here we have a d tuple, and as we saw be, be, be before, considering only the zero kernel is not going to be enough for the pi disk. But you need to to consider a lot of kernels at the same time, all the admissible ones. And so you pick an admissible kernel on, on the pi disk, and then you have a pair of, of commuted matrices m1 and 2 and you define uh, in HK the subspace HKM, that is the orthogonal complement in the reproducing kernel Hilbert space HK of all those functions, again, that vanish at, at M. And this not only, again, if M is just a <clears throat> scalar, so if M is, is just a point of, on the by disk, that again will be the line span through the kernel at that point. But also this kind of funny re re reproducing property holds, namely the set of function that belongs to this HKM is exactly the set of uh, function that reproduce the value of F at the matrix M in the sense that there exist two vectors U and V in C of whatever the size of the pairs M is, such that F in the product with HK in the Hilbert space is equal to FMU in the product B in CM. So this extends also the reproducing property from um, scalar to matrices. And this, of course, I didn't say that, but this is true also for D equal to one. So this is true also for the uh, sequence HN that we define for the hard space, this uh, rep reproducing property. And so, uh, the way that we extend the Carlson and Adler characterization is basically by replacing the kernel functions with those uh, subspaces here, H and K. And so we prove that a sequence of pairs of commuting matrices in the, with spectra in the by disk is interpolating if and only if uh, each one of those uh, uh, sequence of subspaces in each one of those admissible reproducing kernel Kruger spaces is a risk system with a uniform bound C. And of course, this is true as far as we know for D equal to two. So this extends uh, Adler and the Carthy characterization. 
from scalars to matrices for the bad disk. Um, and then uh, regarding the Burston theorem, what we uh, work with is like to, trying to e extend the notion of Bison distance to uh, those matrices. And so, for example, the distance between two uh, pairs of the medium matrices A n and A j would just be uh, you just look at all the function the, the functions in H infinity that uh, are e e equal to the identity at A n and they are zero at AJ. And then you take the one that uh, has the least H infinity norm. And one over there, that quantity will be the equivalent distance between those two matrices, which I, 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 again, if those were scalar, will correspond to the, the uh, equivalent distance that we saw before. And so the, the question becomes, uh, can we extend the first implication of Burston theorem? So he, is that true that if uh, those sequences are strongly separated in this sense, then um, it's interpolating. So we didn't, I, uh, we didn't, uh, we, I, I wasn't able to uh, prove that yet. I'm still working on it. But I kind of got to um, consider a, an even stronger separation condition and show that that's enough to have an interpolating sequence. Namely, you just want to separate each matrix AN from the rest of the sequence A. So you want to look at all the H infinity function that vanishes at outside AN in the sequence and there are the entity and AN. Take the one with least H infinity norm. And if the products of all those quantity is uh, convergent, then uh, um, the sequence that you started with is in interpolating. And this is just for, again, for D equal to two, so for pairs of commuting matrices. Um, I have other minutes. I'm going to try to, so I'm going to skip the example here and try to talk about the non commutative case instead. So, as, as I was saying before, if the D tuples not, of those matrices do not commute, that you cannot apply a conventional holomorphic function, but you need to completely change the class of function that you apply to those things. And so you also need to change the, the, the kind of domain you look at. And so you need to start talking about NC domains, NC function theory, and so on. So the ambient space, when you work with NC functions, is this M, M and ND, which is the set of all D tuples of N by N matrices, commuting or non-commuting. And you, you basically ignore them with the row norm. And then you take the union, the disjoint union of all the levels. So namely, you just take <clears throat> MD to be the set of all D tuples of matrices of, 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 of any size. And you uh, endow it with the disjoint union topology in this uh, talk, at least. There are many topologies that you can use, but that's the one that we're going to use now. <clears throat> Which means that a uh, subset of MD is open if it's open at each level. And open at each level, I, I mean with respect to this norm that I just defined before, with, 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 the, with the row norm. So now a subset of MD is uh, an NC domain if it's closed under direct sum. And the one that we're gonna look at for our interpolation problem is the non-commutative unit ball. So the set of all the points of D tuples in MD uh, whose row norm is uh, strictly less than one. Okay, now that, that, that we have NC domain, we're gonna have to have NC function. A classic ex example of, of an NC function is, is a non-commutative polynomial. So a polynomial in which the variables do not com commute. In general, for an NC function, we're gonna ask that <clears throat> it's uh, graded. So that if you take a N by N D tuple, it's gonna give you an N by N out, 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 output. We're going to ask that it respects uh, um, direct sum. So f of z plus w is f of z direct sum with f of w. And it's that it's um, it re respect left hinter Werner. So if you have a invertible matrix P and an uh, n by n d tuple z, then uh, when you conjugate the P, you get P of minus one f of z uh, times P. Um, provided, of course, that this p minus one z p, which is done co coordinate wise, belongs to omega uh, to begin with. And uh, among those functions, there are going to be the NC hol holomorphic ones, whereby holomorphic 
In this non-commutative setting, it means that they're just uh, lo locally bounded with respect to uh, this joint unit topology. And a very useful fact is that if your domain is nice enough, like the unit ball is, this non-commutative unit ball is, then being holomorphic, it means, again, to have a non-commutative power series. The difference, of, of course, is that the coefficient, so the indices here, the L, is not going to be an, an integer, but it's going to be a, a word with the gen, gen, generators. So in particular, Z to the power of a, of a word L, it's just going to be, uh, oops, I should, so here's the data type. So it should be Z1 to the L1, Z2 to the L2, and so on. And of course, uh, since the D2 plus Z has non-commutative non uh, uh, entries a priori, uh, for example, the word 1, 2, and the word 2, 1 will give you two different things in this case. OK, so before I start talking about interpolated sequences in this setting, let me briefly talk about some uh, uh, notions of non-commutative reproducing kernel Hilbert space that one has in, uh, for this non-commutative unit ball. And in particular, one can define the NC Drury Harvison space as uh, the set of all those power series, non-commutative power series, with uh, square summable coefficients again. And it turns out to be, as for the Hardy space in the commutative setting, that turns out to be a reproducing kernel Hilbert space. And by that, I mean that you can generate the NC Drury Harvison space, H2D, has <clears throat> the linear span of all those uh, kernel functions, KW of UD, where W is a point of the unit ball, the D tuple in the unit ball, U of V are just vectors in CN, where N is the size of W. And what is nice about those KWUV is that, again, they, rep they uh, have a rep reproducing property. Namely, the inner product in the Drury Harvison space of any function f in H2, d in the Drury Harvison space, with one of those kernel functions will give you, uh, will give you uh, f of w times u times d. So that's kind of the property that replaced the uh, reproducing property for uh, the, this non, non commutative setting, which kind of lo looks alike the one that we found for the commutative setting as well. And uh, <clears throat> of course, these spaces, these NC spaces are very well studied. And in particular, uh, uh, Salomon, Shalit, and Shamovich proved recently that the multiparty algebra of those, uh, of this NC Drury Harvison space is exactly what we would call the NC H infinity. So the NC replacement to a bounded analytic function, which is the set of all non-commutative holomorphic function on the unit ball, um, <clears throat> such that you know, the supremum norm in the operator norm is, um, is uh, bounded. And so since that's the case, we're gonna define a sequence of matrices in the non-commutative of D tuples, sorry, of matrices in the no, in, in the non-commutative unit ball, to be interpolating, if for any bounded sequence in this NC multiplier algebra in this H infinity, you can find one function in NC H infinity that you know interpolates the ZN, sorry, that ag agrees with phi n at the ZN, and again, this will be the same as asking that you can you know. That, you can, that you're able to do it with just diagonal targets. So for any bounded sequence in C, there exists one function in this non-commutative H infinity that sends Zn to each, uh, to Wn times that entity. And here, again, let me stress that out. Each Zn can have a different size. It's not like they are two by two three, or three by three. The first one can be seven by seven. The second one can be 100 times 100. So all those D tuples, they're all D of, of, of them. So D is, is fixed. But the size of uh, the entries of the D tuples, that's not. It can be of whichever. Right. And so <clears throat> the, uh, it turns out that uh, they see the, the, those kernel functions, these non commutative kernel function that we saw before, kind of uh, works. Uh, well, in the sense that if you take the orthogonal component in the Drury Harrison space of all the functions that vanish at uh, Zn, 
thanks to the re reproducing property, that's exactly equal to the whole collection of the current of all possible kernel function at the end when you let the parameter u and n b vary in uh, c of s n here. S, s n is the dimension, is the size of the n, of course. And so what we prove is that again, if those h n, so those kind of kernel, those non-commutative kernel function are a risk system that will be equivalent to the sequence z being interpolating. And for a more stronger, for, I guess for a stronger uh, sufficient condition, <clears throat> you can also prove that if, you know, if you take the sign of the angle between each kernel at the span of all the other, and then you multiply all of them, if that quantity is positive, then your sequence is interpolating. And let me just conclude, sorry, I'm a little bit late, but let me just conclude with an example of what I'm talking about. Like the easiest example that you can think of probably, like you have a, a sequence of pairs of non-commutative matrices now, because Zn1 and Zn2, <coughs> as defined here, do not commute. And if you take the, the row norm of Zn, uh, you get these direct diagonal matrices with entry alpha n and beta n. So uh, for this sequence to be in the non-commutative unit ball, <clears throat> you're asking that the sequence alpha n and beta n belongs to the unit disk. And the idea is, can we characterize when Zn is interpolating uh, depending on some condition on the alpha n and the beta n? And we can, because Z, it turns out that Zn is, is interpolating if and only if uh, the sequence of uh, alpha n, beta n, so the product between alpha n and beta n in the unit disk is interpolating in the very classical sense, in the sense of Carlson. Uh, sorry if I went a little, a little bit late, so that's all I want to say, and I'll just uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. And don't worry about the time, it's fine. Okay. I just thank didn't you. ask, I forgot. No, no, it's okay, thank you. Uh, do we have any questions, Tolbert? Can I just j jump in? Go Hello? For it. Uh, um, so, uh, Alberto, so here are two questions. One is specific and one is general. Uh, the specific one, so for uh, examples of interpolating sequences are kind of hard to come by. Uh, you know, because testing the condition is very difficult. So uh, the, the the example I always think of in if the if you have a sequence of lambda ends in the real line, it's interpolating if and only if it's an exponential sequence. Yes. So if one minus lambda n plus one is less than or equal to some constant less than one times one minus lambda n, is there kind of a matrix version of that? Um. Not that I know of, but that was kind of like the idea that I had in mind when I <clears throat> work on this example here. So like, okay. again, I have a, a, a sequence of radii, Rn, and what I'm doing is that I'm attaching like two to the n, and two to the n is arbitrary. It could be like whatever, like infinite sequence, of course, uh -huh. uh, of eigenvalues, and then I consider the relative matrix. So the matrix, the nth matrix, has two to the n eigenvalues equidistributed all on the circle of radius Rn. That was the idea. And so that was kind of the idea, the question that I, you know, asked myself and then that, that led to this kind of like theorem here, which is kind of like, um, I would say not surprising, but like... Um, so you, you claim that that's a, a version of the exponential s sequences thing? No, because they're not, they not, they do not need to be exponential anymore. Right. Here, Rn equal to, uh, you know, well, they just, I mean, yes and no, because, uh, for example, in the example that you were saying before, if you take one minus n squared, that's a zero sequence, but it's not in, in, interpolating. Uh, Here okay. you have that zero sequence and interpolating sequences in this like Hickey distributed setting are the, the, the same. That's why it was a little bit surprising. But it's not really if you think about what this condition means because you want the whole sequence of like I give values to be interpol uh, a zero sequence. Sorry. Uh, all right. So then the other question is a more but, operator sorry. theory. Sorry. The other question is a more operator theory question mm -hmm. is um, so it seems like. <clears throat> 
if you have, you can replace matrices with bounded operators in your definition of interpolating. And you can have bounded operators from different Hilbert spaces. And it seems like the only thing you need to have is that the spectrum of each operator is contained in the open disk. Yes, definitely. But if you want to separate those uh, operator, you will be want to separate uh, their spectra. That's what uh, we're, that, that that's what's happening here with matrices at, at least. Separating those operators means that you can separate the spectra. And if you know, that means that, for example, the spectrum of your operator has to be countable because if it's uncountable, in, or, or if the spectrum of one operator accumulate inside the unit disk, then any function that vanishes on those set of points will vanish everywhere in the unit disk. Uh, okay, so when you do your your HN, your model spaces, let's call them that, They're the, just everything, the yeah. functions at H2 would vanish at the... Yeah. Uh, well, they have to vanish at this point. Okay, so you can th you, you've uh, thought about this notion and you want to stick to matrices. I guess you can push it to infinite matrices if you want, but then you will have to ask the same kind of separation conditions on the spectrum. Which... Well, infinite, to me, infinite matrices are operators anyway. Right, sure. But right. the eigenvalues, uh, sorry, the uh, you want if you really want to be able to separate the spectrum with holomorphic function, then you want to ask, uh, you're going to ask some very re re restrictive condition on the uh, spectrum of those of the spectra of those operators. Okay. Which, you, you know, it, it's fine for matrices because they're just finally many points for a matrix. That's what the spectrum is. But I think that if you want to extend this theory for operators, instead you want to be uh, more uh, careful with that, or against okay. it. All right, so you 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 you've you've thought this through, okay? Obviously, yeah. Okay, yeah, so I go. So, 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 so someone else should be able to ask some questions now, right? Yeah. We have other questions. Uh, I the reason I'm I'm asking questions is I've been having co a lot of conversations about Alberto on this stuff. So as I finally understand what's going on, I have more questions to enhance my understanding here, so. Oh, well, do we have any other questions or is that it? Okay, well, if there are no other questions, let me, let me stop the recording here. Thanks.